Good evening, everyone. I just want to introduce myself. I am Father uh, JB An Yuen Nguyen, so just call me Father JB. I'm the pastor of uh, Mary Mother of the Church. Uh, so it is uh, nice to be here with you tonight to share with you some reflection and studies. And then uh, we learn we learned together about the uh, lecture ministry. But um, before we um, begin our session, let us take some moment of silence and we are going to pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yours is a share in the work of the Lord's Spirit who opens our hearts to God's holy word. Yours is the task of telling our family story, the story of salvation. Yours is to proclaim the true and saving word of God. You are the messenger of God's love for us. Your task is to proclaim the word which challenges, confronts, and captures our hearts. You proclaim a word that heals and comforts and consoles. Yours is the ministry of the table of God's word, which feeds the hungry and the longing of our hearts for truth. Yours is to offer the story of the great things the Lord has done for us, that we might turn to the table of the Eucharist with good cause to give thanks and praise. Yours is nothing less than the ministry of the Lord's voice, calling out in the midst of God's people. Come to your work from your personal prayer, praying that the spirit will open your heart to what you proclaim. Prepare the word which is yours to speak. Study the scriptures. Understand the passage, let it dwell deep within you. Come to your work in awesome reverence of the word you proclaim. It is the Lord's word. Come to your ministry as one judged and saved by the word you speak. Anyone can read the scripture in public. Only the believer can proclaim them. Approach the ambo, the table of the Lord's word, as you would the Lord himself with reverence and awe. Handle the book of the Lord's word with great care. It is a tabernacle of the Lord's presence. Amen. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is a beautiful prayer from um, the, the book Lectures Ministry by Austin Fleming. And um, when we listen to it, we can um, we can know how privileged we are as we are called to be uh, lectors or proclamers. And uh, today, let us uh, begin with um, the definition about the liturgy, because all of us get involved in the liturgy. Um, today, uh, I know that like uh, some what I'm going to share with you might not be uh, uh, new to you, but it's, I think it's wonderful um, opportunity for us to refresh our knowledge and and especially renew and refresh uh, our zeal uh, for, for this service as well and our love for the word of God. Now, because the lectures ministry is involved in liturgy, we often talk about the liturgy. So what is liturgy? The word liturgy comes from a Greek word meaning public work or the work of people. And that hit nearer the mark, liturgy is a special kind of work in which the divine and human come together. We do something, but most importantly, God does something. First and foremost, it's all about God. God who acts in the liturgy and we, we respond to him. And the liturgy is the divine worship of the church 
I mean here the official worship and prayer of the church and includes the celebration of mass, the celebration of the sacrament and the divine office or a daily prayer of the church. And the celebration of the Eucharist is the sword and summit of our faith. And so all other liturgies flow from and to the celebration of mass. So what does the liturgy do? The liturgy gathers us in the presence of God. Liturgy helps form us into a community. Liturgy is always about a pastoral mystery. And we know that in the liturgy, we meet Christ and four presence of Christ at Mass. The priests who act in Pexona Christi, the community of believers who are gathered there in the name of Christ, the word of God that we are to go into, look into, and the Eucharist. And the liturgy is the worship, the official worship of the whole church. So the liturgy both reflects and shapes our faith. Through liturgy, our faith is shaped. And as uh, we just uh, discussed, the liturgy is the word of God, right? God acts in the liturgy and we respond to his grace. We can respond with our word and our adoration, but at the same time, we are called to respond by our, act, our action as well. And that's why the liturgy is not just uh, like finished uh, with things that is a liturgical celebration. Think about mass and after mass, all of us need to continue mass in our daily life. That is the way we respond um, to, um, to the liturgy, to the grace and the act of God. So particularly, let us go to the liturgy of the word within mass. And uh, we all know that in the mass, we have two parts, the liturgy of the word and the Eucharistic, Eucharistic celebration. In the mass is spread the table both of the words of God and the body of Christ. And from it, the faithful are to be instructed and refreshed. And we often say, we see two tables um, uh, at mass, the table of the word, just like the anvil, and the table of, uh, the, of the, the, the Eucharist. However, it just formed as a, a one table only, um, two part, but they always um, connect with each other. And that's why the sacred scripture is a profound importance in the celebration of the liturgy. The liturgy of the word prepares for the liturgy of the Eucharist and leads into it, forming within, within one act of worship, only one act of worship there. That means the liturgy of the word leads us to the liturgy of the Eucharist. That is very important and as we know that um, we're talking about divine revelation. Like we talk uh, in the Catholic Church, we believe in the, the sacred scripture and the tradition. And, um, and the sacred scripture helps us to understand the tradition. And the tradition helps us to understand the sacred scripture. And think about Mass as well, or any other liturgy, even in baptism, right? In baptism, we also have the, the word of God people are called to listen to the word of God before we celebrate that sacrament. The word of God is a like, the sacrament is accompanied by the word of God. That's very important. So the word of God deserves our respect. Readers are not to change the text of the, the introduction or conclusion of the reading, nor of the reading itself, the reading was prepared by translators who worked hard to make the original language understandable when reading out aloud today. The translation has been approved by our bishops and confirmed by the Vatican for proclamation at the liturgy. And especially we know that um, the liturgy is, 
is uh, the word of God is spoken, is proclaimed in the liturgy. That means God is speaking to us. The gospel, the word, the word, when we say the word of God, and the word is not the book. The word is not the book. The word, the word is the spoken word. The word of God does not dwell in communal reading, but in communal hearing. That's very important. When the reader is well prepared, the people are listening and looking at the lecture and the book is less important than the voice, okay? And that's why here we talk about the spoken word. When the scriptures are read, it is as if the book disappears. The reader becomes the mouthpiece of God. God uses the reader's voice to say something more than something new and something that applies to the world today. When the word of God is proclaimed at mass, that means God is speaking to us here and now in our situation particular in our situation, particular to each and every one of us, so that when God's word is not history, it is a life. And the liturgy accents this reality. And that's why when we read the word of God, it's not a, a dead, it's not dead words, but it's a living word because the son of God is the living word. Jesus Christ, is the living words. He's not just the historical person who lived 2000 years ago, but he's living with us now and here. And that's why the word of God is active and alive. Okay, and then uh, um, the third part I'm going to share with you about developing a uh, process for preparing a reading. I think I'm going to go with you three, uh, four part. First of all, prayer, prepare, practice, and proclaim. We will go uh, through each point. Prayer, prepare, practice, and uh, proclaim. Now, prayer. Let us consider a method described by the acronym ACTS, ACTS, A-C-T-S, A, adore, adore, praise God's sovereignty, power, and love, confess, C, confess, acknowledge our own humanity, our own limitation, acknowledge our unworthiness as well with humility. Give thanks, okay, T, give thanks for God's word, for my own abilities, and for our faith community. Okay, and then finally as with Acts, ask, God speak to our assembly through me. First, by speaking to me, ask for the deepest meaning of the text to be revealed to me. Pray to be an, an effective servant. Okay. Adore, confess, give thanks, and ask for supplication. S stands for supplication. I, I hope that's easy to remember. So we're done with prayer. Remember that when we uh, prepare for the word of God, always put it in the context of prayer. Then the next step is prepare. Well, we cannot proclaim if we, if we don't understand. So pre preparation is vital. A good guideline is to begin a week before your scheduled proclamation or at least a few days before, and uh, to spend a minimum of half an hour in preparation, 
or even an hour. An hour may not be too long. And there are a variety of different ways to prepare. I'll describe one way that works for many proclaimers. Now, first of all, read. Read, and you see it in, in the outline, you say that gospel first. Well, you are assigned to, to read the first reading or a second reading. Why the gospel first? The gospel for the priest. Anyway, it, it has its reason. Now, we need to know that the core of each Sunday message is in the gospel. And the first reading, the psalm and the gospel is always go together. They share the same theme. And that's why it's good for us to read the gospel and to, 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 to know the, the, the core, the meaning, and then the main message uh, that the church wants us to, to reflect on. Now, review all four readings to get overall message. And the gospel is the core of the liturgy of the word. The other readings and response all support the message of the gospel. So you, you know that the first reading, psalm, and the gospel always go together. So it makes sense to read the gospel first, then the first reading, the responsible psalm, and the second reading. Look up your assigned text and read the passages that come before and after that. We need to know the context of all, right? Look up it and then... Uh, uh, read the passage that come before and after it to gain a better understanding of the context of your reading. It can also be helpful to briefly review all readings from the week prior and the week following to see the, the even larger picture. I think it's, re it's really helpful. Uh, personally, even when I, I prepare my homily, I often look back right, um, for the last week or I even uh, look, read the gospel in the bigger context. Now, next step, we need to uh, identify genre or genre or form, speaker, a theme, and voice. So the form of the text, uh, today I just would like to uh, to to share with you on the three forms. Now, before talking about form, I would like to introduce, uh, to present to you a book that we often use in our parish. I hope that you can see it here. This is the workbook for lectors, gospel readers and proclaimers of the word. And there is a very clear guideline here. Uh, is help us, but so what we need to emphasize when it focused on the pronunciation, they have all footnote here. The footnote is interpretation, and here they can tell us the, the 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 form of the text as well. Okay, for example, here we see like, like an exhortatory reading. So one of one of the form is exhortation. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Uh, I would encourage you if you are you are proclaimers, you can have it. So uh, this um, have been used in my parish, and uh, it's really good. It's really helpful. Okay. So the margin note in the workbook, the book that I just uh, show you. So I often mention the form of the text and. Um, today we to talk about uh, three forms uh, that often be used like narrative, teaching, and exhortation. Narrative, teaching, or didactic, and exhortation. Now, narr narrative, a narrative text reads like a story, may have characters, dialogue, a setting, or a and action. A point of view may be that of narrator or any character in the story. So we need to we, we need to uh, to identify who tell the story, something like that. 
Okay. Creature is full of story about creation, about ancestors, it faith, the history of Israel, the life of Jesus, ministries of early apostles. And strive to, to help your assembly understand what is happening in the story. Narrative, um, like try to keep the character this thing. First, by understand who they are. And then by voices you use for each character, and you know how you, how you, you know how to, to tell a story. Right? And that's why we say, so we're not just read the word of God, but I say we proclaim and we tell, we tell. And be clear about the shift in setting. Sometimes there's a shift, a change in, in, in uh, settings uh, in one passage. For, exa for example, Luke's story about Lazarus and the rich man. Mansion versus gate, heaven with Abraham versus place of torment. We need to see um, uh, such kind of like, uh, yeah, the construct uh, setting. Help the community to see the story unfold. Stories may be very familiar through years of repetition. Have you ever temptation like, oh, you just, when they just read one of two sentences and you know what they are doing to talk about, right? And I, oh, so I already know that story. So maybe I don't need to be paying attention for that. Well, that is a great temptation for me as well. And that's why stories may be very familiar through years. Um, but how, that's why our task is to bring back a sense of wonder so that the stories release the power to amaze them, to amaze the people. That means we need to renew our wonders again, amazement again. That is our, uh, our job. Now, and the second form is uh, didactic uh, or teaching. We see a lot, especially in the letters of St. Paul. And a deducted, a deducted text may contain a logical argument or make a case to support a point the author has made. The letters of St. Paul consist mainly of teaching texts. So, are the texts describing the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels as well. It is important to understand that the author's points and any supporting arguments are logic. Our goal is to help the assembly follow the logic and understand what's being taught. I remember when I first um, came to Canada and I, my first year in Canada, I studied English. And one of our job is that like the teacher gave her the text, right? And we need to go through the text and identify what is what is the main um, theme, what is the main top the main topic, and and what is the supporting ideas. And we need to identify, and we need to make an outline so that we can see the whole pictures. That was uh, my practice when I first came here eight years ago, and I think it's still pretty helpful um, for us if we do it with uh, the, 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 the scriptures. And um, the third one is exhortation. A text of exhortation makes an argument, an, an urgent appeal may encourage, warn, or challenge, often includes a call to actions. Emotions are heightened and stakes are high. Sometimes the exhortation is directed to God, pleading for mercy or justice, or praising God's goodness and love. Other times, God addresses the people directly. In texts of assertion, it is essential to convey the urgency and passion behind the words. I think we just tried uh, one of uh, them here, one of the readings. We can try it here. 
for example, like I'm going to read a, read from uh, the book of uh, Prophet Jeremiah, right? This this one is an exhortation. The word of the Lord came to me saying, "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born." I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And you know this this kind this kind of text is a, um, a the form of an exhortation. So let us move to uh, the next step is the biblical. We need to learn about the biblical and historical context of the reading. While you are looking at a theme and form the readings and gauging its mood, you will also want to look at the overall context of the piece. Find the reading in the Bible to see what comes before and after the introductions and notes in a good study Bible or biblical commentary will give much helpful background. We can have some questions like this, a very practical question for us when we explore the meaning of a text. How are the main characters? What are their roles in this reading? Have they appeared elsewhere in the Bible? If so, do they have a back story that would help you to understand this passage? What is the setting, time, and place of the reading? Does the setting give any additional information about what is going on? What are the historical events surrounding this reading? So is there Sometimes we cannot understand uh, the message if we don't know the background, the biblical and historical background and context of, of, of the passage uh, the text. Now, and uh, we need to consider the reading in the context of the liturgical year as well. You know, each season has its own sense and flow. Uh, that is evident in the in the readings reflect on where your reading occurs in relation to the weeks that have come before and will come after and uh, each sunday um, especially uh, with a, a particular season they have particular theme it's good for us to see to understand um, the reading in the in the whole uh, liturgical celebration of the church. So what might, we can ask a question, what, what might be significant about when this reading falls in the season? How does that affect its message? Okay. And uh, other staff, so um, we are on, on this, on the, at the two step right prepare okay and finally in the prepare we need to pray with the scripture we say pray at the beginning and now at this time after explored the text we need to come back to pray at this point it can be helpful to spend a few minutes meditating on the reading so that its meaning becomes clear this is a continuation a prayer we began with. Now, prayer is really important because when we, I said, I, um, with the talk at the beginning, when we read the word of God, so not only do we read the word of God, but we are in a dialogue with God, right? We're in a dialogue with God. And that is very important for us to read the word of God with prayer. And that's why Pope John Paul II, he said in uh, DS Domini, he said that this, if Christian individuals and families are not regularly drawing new life from the reading 
of the sacred text in the spirit of prayer and docility to the church interpretation, then it is difficult for the liturgical proclamation of the word of God alone to produce the fruit we might expect. We see that we need to read the word of God under the light of prayer. We know that we are in a dialogue with God and under the guidance of the church interpretation, the church's interpretation. Now, pray, prayerful preparation also helps us to keep in mind that our Sunday gatherings and our ministry within this sacred space are not about us or even about our community, not about us or even our community. We are just a servant of the word of God. Our prayer at Sunday Eucharist is about what God did for us and continues to do for us through Jesus Christ. What God did in the olden day, he continues to do for us now, here and now. And a prayerful, Christ-centered approach to scripture will come across in your proclamation and will be great service to the assembly. Okay, so um, as uh, with uh, four steps, we have done two, prayer and prepare. We are going to move to the practice. There's many different ways to practice. Um, so even though we might have proclaimed for years, it is always a good idea to proclaim your reading at home before proclaiming um, at church. Well, might not be outdoor or on the deck in case your neighbors complain. Um, but you can do it in a quiet room or maybe for a spouse, or a partner, a friend whose opinion we value. But uh, practicing your reading does not necessarily have to be done out loud. Nor you can, um, what I often do is that I often, uh, I often record right? my, my, my practice. I record and I rewatch it sometimes. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to hear my voice there. <laughs> but um, it's, it's really good, it's really good for us. Um, from my, uh, my own uh, experience, you know, that's uh, before during pandemic, we have live stream mass. And when I rewatched um, live stream mass, especially my homily, I know what I should say and what I should not say and what I should, pro um, how I should pronounce something like that. You know, and, and then how uh, what I can uh, value and um, evaluate my, my uh, just like my uh, voice, the pace and pronunciation, all kinds of work to do. Um, but uh, that's a, one of the, 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 the methods. So find a practice uh, that works for you and do it faithfully. Uh, I encourage you not to look over and skip that step. Um, until now, I've been in that Mary Mother for two years. And until now, especially uh, before Saturday Mass, I often have uh, well, one or uh, two people uh, come to help me listen to, listen to my homily or listen to um, my pro uh, pro uh, proclamation, proclamation of the word and help me to, to correct and uh, uh, pronunciation and all kinds of uh, yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, just find a, a, a method that, that help you. And we are going to move to the final step. That is, uh, that is a long one. Uh, proclaim. Proclaim. Uh, we done together. Pray. Uh, the prayer. Uh, prepare. Right. And practice. And now proclaim. Tools is the voice and body too. 
simple, simply reading the words uh, clearly from the ample is not enough for an effective proclamation. We also have to pay, we also have to pay attention to how we are communicating with our tone, our pace, volume, eyes, contacts, face, and even our posture. Now, nonverbal cues. Studies confirm that we take in as much from nonverbal cues as we do from spoken words. Now I can give the example. You can see I, I went, I'm going to say one sentence, one statement. I have some news for you. Or I have some news for you. And you see that two different attitudes, two different messages. It concerned, looked on my face, spoken slowly, low tone. You already know Noah uh, is uh, something sad and difficult, upsetting. They would say, well, I, I have some news for you, right? Um, for example, if family members has been just diagnosed with a serious illness, now it contrasts that with, I have some news for you, excited, eyes shining and energy in my voice. And you know, my news is positive, uplifting, happy. For example, just like a child has just been born, right? And notice that the verbal part of the message, the spoken words are exactly the same in both cases, yet the meaning is completely different. I have some news for you. Okay. Um, for example, in, 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 in the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We cannot read it like Rejoice in the Lord always. So again, I will say rejoice. No, you know. And uh, now the look on, on, on my face has to mirror the meaning and fully convey the message. I need to look like I'm rejoicing. If I don't, well, much of impact is lost. And, and the reading can fall flat. So pace, pace. The most common problem of all is going too fast or to be easily, uh, going too fast to be easily understood. We need to read at a pace that is moderate enough so our listeners can absorb the message we are speaking the brain and this uh, time to catch it, right? What the ears are hearing. Uh, also, some in the assembly have a hearing impairment or for others, English is an additional language. So by proclaiming um, at a modest pace, we make it easier for them to understand. And the pace can change according to the context of the text as well, the meaning of it. Sometimes it's fast, faster, sometimes it is slower. And pauses. Pauses are really important. Uh, very often we forget that. Um, now, proclaim, proclaiming too quickly is one of the two most common faults among proclaimers everywhere. And uh, the other failing is to, like, to pause between thoughts or statement. Pauses are critical. That allow our assembly to follow the sense of the text. Listeners need moments to absorb what they have just heard before they move on to the next thought or speaker. We need to pause in order to separate thoughts, distinct thoughts. 
okay, to indicate major shift in thoughts or set apart significant statements. We should never pause in the middle of a single thought. Uh, what can, can help us is that we see the punctuation. Our major guide for when we went to pause is punctuation. In general, pause and take full breath at periods, question marks, ex exclamation marks, and sometimes at columns and semicolons, at commas and think, uh, at, at commas and think, have a pause. Now, pause, pause required before the word of the Lord. When we say the word of the Lord, when we finish our reading, take time. Pause is always required at the end of the text before we say the word of the Lord. A pause after the body of the text does two things. It allows our listeners to absorb the final thought of the reading. It prepares us to acknowledge that the reading is complete when we do say that a final phrase, the word of the Lord, it is important to say them clearly and distinctly without brushing, because it is a proclamation, the word of the Lord, but be careful to keep the energy level up and don't let your voice drop. Um, this closing phrase is a vital part of your proclamation. It requires the same attention and honor as the rest of the text. Of the text. Okay. And pause is also required after our proclamation is complete. What does that, what do I mean by that? Now, after the 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 the, uh, the whole assembly responds by uh, saying, "Thanks be to God." Now, at that moment. We are called to lead a period of silence. This to, is to give the assembly time to absorb and pray about what they've just heard. I, I think I think sometimes like I, I have been reminded of a period of silence as well by my parishioners. I sometimes I say, even after the harmony, the people were. People come to your father, could you just take, take some moment of silence there for, for us to have a time to reflect your harmony or some moment of silence for us to reflect on the readings. And, and silence in the liturgy is really, really important. Don't forget it. At, um, at Mary Mother, uh, our practice is that, uh, that's, uh, since Father Kevin was there and then when I came, I, I was told that, and it's, it's, I, I think it's a wonderful uh, practice, and I, I still keep it here in my parish. Now, um, we suggest that at least five seconds or even 10 seconds, right? Um, eyes closed, bow your head a little bit, just like you are in the state of meditation, and you, or you are absorb, absorbing the word of God and praying about the word of God, because you, you need to help the people to pray at that moment too. And this encourages our assembly to pray as well. Now, this is not a flat spot in the liturgy. Instead, it is an active silence. It is an active silence because we are praying. Uh, we, we, we would consume, we, 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 are, we are eating the word of God. Now, then the next minister, the cantor, to lead us in the responsible song or the priest or deacon about the proclamation of the gospel we will not come forward until we leave the ember. Okay, for example, we can say that is after finishing the text, we say the word of the Lord. And the people say, thanks be to God. And then we just take time, just a moment of silence. Like this. And then slowly to uh, remove from the apple.
that is uh, the practice uh, of 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 my, of my uh, of, at my parish. Maybe uh, you also have something, maybe a little different or uh, other practice in your parish. Just follow the guide of your parish, okay? And volume and vocal energy is really important as well. Volume means not just loudness, but also softness. It means choosing the right level of sound for a particular part of the text. And vocal energy is equally important. It is the strength of my intention. I need vocal energy even when my volume is low, even when I am speaking softly. Pronunciation. Uh, we want to pronounce names and terms correctly. And if you have uh, the slightest doubt, look into the margin note of the workbook. And we have a lot, especially the name um, of biblical characters. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to, for us to pronounce. And we have uh, the guide right here. I can give the example. This is all the name in the, I hope that you can see it. Okay. And this is the text. And this is the margin with the name. Yeah, it shows us how to pronounce them properly. Now, if you can, if you cannot find an answer there, try an online resource. And when we pronounce words correctly, we help the assembly focus on the meaning of the text without distraction. And that's why when you say, the letter of St. Paul to Philippians. Just make sure that yeah, you are not going to say Filipino. Right? The letter of St. Paul to Filipino. And you, and you also heard about the, you know, heard about the, um, the book of Sirach, right? The book of Sirach. But don't confuse it with Siraja. Okay, you know the Siraja is kind of the hot sauce. That is one of my favorite as well. So don't say uh, the reading from the book of Siracha. Or the book of Job. <laughs> the book of Job, yeah, Job. Job, yeah. Okay, now eye contact. Oh, that is sometimes challenging too. Eye contact is necessary for a, an effective proclamation. Eye contact is the way connecting with the person, right? Um, we, I even when in, in such a um, uh, presentation like this, still, I still need to the eye contact with the people, especially from the audience. Um, and it establishes confidence. We don't trust someone we want, who won't look at us when they speak. So visual contact also connects our listeners to reading more deeply than if we were using our voice only. Too much eye contact can be just as a distracting as a too little. So best when it's done naturally and comfortably. Um, I can give an example. A good time to establish a contact is, is during the opening. For example, like a reading, a reading from the book of just like I say, the book of uh, Sirach, our prophet uh, uh, Jeremiah, and then stand still bef before you begin reading. I pause here, I pause there, look at the people, and then you can continue to read. You know, and put the whole opening phrase in your short term memory right before you speak. Create a significant silence before you begin speaking. And this will compel the assembly's attention. Look across the entire room as you say the opening phrase. Then pause again and begin the reading. No rush, no rush. Um, have your attention on your audience as you speak. If you do this, eye contact will take care itself, of itself. Have respect for the assembly, remembering that you are conveying 
God's word to God's people in God's presence. Well, try to look at, at the audience in different direction as well. And uh, um, keeping your place is a challenge when you, when you use your eye contact or you can just use your finger and go along with the margin. Right, but don't 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 use your finger to go from the uh, just like words by words like this. No, is it not recommended? But just, just keep like this. Is it easier for you? Easier for you to 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 follow. Right, and facial expression as well. Your face can communicate a great deal to the assembly about the reading. When God's people are being admonished, our face should indicate the seriousness of the message. And if you are invited to read a part of the Passion on Palm Sunday or Good Friday, right, your face needs to convey this kind of seriousness as well. Um, and, but at other time, the expression of your face will tell the people that you are rejoicing you are joyful because you are, bringing, you are bringing good news to the people. So a smile on your face, you can have a smile on your face sometimes, but it depends on, on the content of, of, of the text. So the liturgy is of the word, but notice that the liturgy of the word is not intended uh, to be uh, theoretical, not artificial, but sometimes very natural. We are not actors. And we never want to be over tough, right? That would draw the attention of people to you, not to God. So, so we would get uh, in the way um, of our assembly being able to focus on the word of God. But our proclamation cannot fully reach our assembly if it is not expressive, so as we prepare our proclamation, we need to make choices about expression. If Paul is rejoicing, or Jeremiah a grumbling, or God is expressing compassion, then the emotion we need to express is clear. In other cases, we need to make our own choice as well. Um, almost done. So our challenge, proclaiming expressively without excess can be challenging. Many people are uncomfortable showing emotion in public, but the scriptures we proclaim aren't sterile and cold stories. They're dynamic and full of passion. When we convey the emotion uh, that is in our text, Right? And um, we convey the meaning. We draw it forth, making it easier for our assembly to understand and be moved by the word of God. Now, how about uh, just uh, very sh uh, uh, briefly about our body. When it's time to address the assembly, hold your body straight. Okay, you hold your shoulder back like this, but don't go too far. So you want to, want to show your pride or something like this, straight, because with confidence, you are the one who proclaim the word of God, present the word of God to the people. Okay, hold your body straight, but not rigid, not like Robert. But don't slouch like this. Okay, you need to, to, to convey the life of the word as well, right? And, um, and just show them that you look like you want to communicate, have authority, be genuine, be unpretentious, be natural. Your feet, uh, keep your feet firmly planted on your, on your why you speak. So uh, that happens sometimes um, when we have funeral and we have to ask somebody who are not uh, in our ministry, uh, to do as uh, a family member to do the reading so uh, really often they when they do the reading they do they stand like this right 
Yeah, maybe the, uh, the, the assembly cannot see, but uh, the priest, it's easy to see it like this. So yeah, just stay now. And then now hands, your height and your eye tracking abilities allowed to hold a book uh, while you speak to provide a visual reminder of the source of the word. And that, I mean, hold a book, not hold up like this. Okay, just hold a book. This is good, but not essential. Uh, whether you hold it or rest uh, it on the amble, as you read, you might find it useful to run your finger along the text as I just uh, show with you. Just make sure you, that, that you don't distract the people. Um, I remember when I was a, um, a deacon, I went to a parish right? and then uh, at that uh, that Sunday, I was supposed to preach uh, because I need to do some practice. Uh, that is the assignment from the seminary, and we need to have the evaluation from uh, five people in the congregation. And one of the evaluations saying that they, like this, uh, my mistake was that it's, I, I, it's great, and I learned from that. Right, just like when I when I read. And I wasn't, I wasn't confident in my English as well. And that's why I need to use my finger. And I run my finger like this, word by word, right? For example, like this. But at the other time, the at presence on face, something like that. You know, it, when we run uh, the fingers like this, we really distract people. Hand gestures are occasionally appropriate, something like this but use them only if they clearly enhance the reading, okay? And finally, we are human. We make mistakes. We are human, we all make mistakes. So when we mispronounce a word or stumble on a phrase, the best way for a word is to simply to repeat it correctly, if we say sorry, so we would draw the attention of the people to our mistake and errors, right? Uh, but sometimes it's kind of natural, we spawn natural reaction, oh, I'm sorry, it's not like this. But we don't need to say sorry, we don't need to say apologize, just repeat it correctly, just correct it, okay? Um, um, and uh, last, but very important as we are the servants of the word of God, we need to live it as well. We need to, and I remember that two, two weeks ago, right, Bishop launched kind of like household of faith that encourages us uh, to have the prayer group in our, in our parishes where we do the lecture divina together. We, we, we live the word of God together during the week, not just Sunday, during the week, and it is, I, I, I believe that is going to be um, help us, uh, helping us a lot, a lot, um, and help us to experience, to taste the beauty, the sweetness, and the strength of the word of God. And remember that the word of God is a living word. It's not just a uh, historical word or the dead words, but it's a living word who is speaking to us in our situation. And uh, we respond to the word of God by uh, bring it about, by living it in our life. In that way, we would become the faithful servant of the word of God. So um, thank you very much. So um, before we finish, um, I would like to finish with a prayer, but at the same time, um, for, for more information that like is, I just want to present the source that I use for this presentation. Of course, uh, this book, the workbook uh, for lecture and the gospel, this book, and uh, this one, I think is really, this one is really helpful. Uh, Guide for Lecture and Readers by the Liturgy Ministry Series, right? And this is very helpful. And you, uh, you can use um, the, the gen general instruction uh, of um, Roman Missal, yeah, in, in just only the Missal. 
um, and the lectionary as well. And another source I used for my presentation today is that in my parish three years ago, our liturgy team made uh, a uh, like two hour session on this. And I learned a lot from that too. And I would say to thank you everyone. So, and now let us take uh, some moment of silence and before we uh, conclude with the prayer. Yours is a share in the work of the Lord's Spirit who opens our hearts to God's holy word. Let your eyes fall open on the faces of the assembly. They are the body of the Lord whose word you proclaim. Let the Lord's peace settle in your heart that your voice may be clear and steady. Let your voice echo the sound of the word with conviction, with gentleness, with strength, and with wonder. Remember that the story you tell is filled with a trauma you need not supply, but must always be. Like the prophet, you will sometimes proclaim no one, what no one wants to hear. Remember always your own need to hear the heart saying, and never imagine that your ministry places you above what you proclaim. If other proclaimers ask for your guidance, be gentle in helping them to improve. If you are new to this ministry, seek out that help which others can give. If you do not know how well you read, ask. Be grateful for constructive criticism and humbled by any praise you receive. Let no minister of the word think that there is nothing left to learn. Another commentary and another worship cannot but help the open mind and heart. When your brothers and sisters praise and thank you for your work, take delight in the word of God, in the word that they have heard, and rejoice in the word the Lord has accomplished through you. Be faithful in the work you do, for though for through it the Lord saves his people. Amen. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you.